Imagine a world where your beach vacation spot doubles as a power plant, or where you can print solar panels as easily as your morning crossword puzzle. Sounds like science fiction, right? Well, buckle up, because that future is arriving faster than you can say, climate crisis averted. Hello, my curious energy enthusiasts. Theodore here, ready to illuminate your minds with a dazzling world of renewable energy innovations. Today, we're diving into a sea of solar breakthroughs and riding the waves of tidal power. Our expert guests will be sharing insights that'll make your head spin faster than a wind turbine in a hurricane. So grab your mental sunscreen, because things are about to get bright. Okay, ready for this. We're diving into renewable energy today. Your request, listener. You sent over a whole stack of articles and reports on it, really digging into solar energy in particular. It seems like you're wondering if it's really going to, you know, take over the world, well, the energy sector at least. Yeah, it's the million dollar question, right? And honestly, 2023 felt like a real turning point. I mean, we knew renewables were on the rise, but the growth last year, especially in solar, pretty remarkable. For sure. Some of the stats in these reports had even my eyebrows shooting up. Like, get this, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, they're saying global renewable capacity could be like 2.7 times larger by 2030. That's practically another couple of United States worth of renewable power in just a few years. Crazy, well, right? It's a massive shift. Mm -hmm. Basically, you know, we're talking about a potential energy revolution in the making. And there are a few big reasons for this surge. One of the biggest. Solar power has gotten seriously cheap. And I don't just mean a little cheaper. It's now often 50% less expensive than coal for new power plants. Huge implications for countries trying to, you know, build out their energy infrastructure. That's got to be a game changer when you're talking about building new power generation. Yeah. Suddenly, solar is not just the green choice. It's often the most economically sensible one. But it's not just cost, is it? You hit the nail on the head. Governments are getting in on the action, too. All over the world, there are policies popping up to incentivize going solar. We're talking tax breaks, subsidies, you name it. Yeah. It's creating this feedback loop where, like, the lower costs encourage more policies, which boost demand, which pushes costs down even further, and so on. So we've got the economics making sense and government support backing it up. What's the third piece of this solar surge puzzle? What's driving the demand? Well, simply put, People want clean energy. Consumers are more environmentally conscious than ever before, and they're putting their money where their mouth is, whether that's installing solar panels on their homes or just demanding their energy providers switch to renewables. Makes sense to me. Everyone's feeling the effects of climate change more and more, so naturally people are going to look for solutions, and solar is looking more affordable and accessible all the time. But got to be realistic, right? Even with all this momentum, I'm guessing there are still some speed bumps on the road to a fully solar-powered world. Oh, you're absolutely right. Plenty of challenges. One of the biggest is actually pretty straightforward. Gridlock. In a lot of places, the current electrical grid just isn't set up to deal with how solar and wind power work. Okay, so explain this to me like I'm back in school learning about the power grid for the first time. What makes solar so tricky to integrate? All right, so imagine a traditional power plant. It just hums along, you know, steady as a rock, supplying a constant flow of electricity. We call that baseload power. Now think about solar. It's intermittent, meaning it fluctuates throughout the day as the sun rises and sets, hides behind clouds, all that. And that variability, it makes things difficult for grid operators who need to maintain a reliable flow of electricity, no matter what the demand is at any given moment. Uh, okay, I think I get it. It's like trying to, I don't know, pour a steady stream of water from a pitcher that keeps filling and emptying at random. You never know how much you've actually got to work with. That's a great analogy. And it highlights why this gets so complicated. We're talking about managing potentially huge swings in both energy supply and demand. And sometimes the grid just doesn't have the capacity to transport all that new solar energy leading to these grid bottlenecks. There are actually thousands of megawatts worth of solar and wind projects right now stuck waiting for grid connections. Wow, I had no idea. So it's not just a matter of slapping up more solar panels. We have to rethink how we manage and move all that energy around. Exactly. And that's where ideas like smart grids come into play. 
Imagine a more responsive, flexible grid that can intelligently manage the flow of electricity from all these different sources, including those intermittent renewables. It's a huge area of research and development right now. Okay, so gridlock check. What other hurdles are there for solar on the horizon? Well, another biggie is supply chain constraints. Basically, can manufacturers actually keep up with this huge demand for solar panels? The IEA report we talked about. It points to some potential bottlenecks, especially when it comes to raw materials. Right. I remember reading about that, sourcing stuff like silicon for the panels, all those rare earth minerals for certain components. It's a whole global supply chain. Exactly. And it's not just about having enough stuff either. We have to make sure that all these materials are sourced ethically and sustainably. We don't want to solve one problem just to create a whole bunch of new ones, especially as solar goes more and more global. For sure. Can't just brush those concerns under the rug. But hey, speaking of cool solar innovations, did you see that thing about those printable solar panels being developed at Oxford? Oh, yeah. Those are fascinating. Huh. Still very early days, but the potential is huge. Imagine a future where your backpack, your phone, even the paint on your house could be generating power. Wild. Whoa, hold up. Let me get this straight. We're talking about solar panels you can print like a grocery list? That's like going from the Gutenberg press straight to a Star Trek replicator. Imagine slapping some solar wallpaper on your house and calling it a power plant. The future's so bright, I gotta wear shades. Totally wild, like truly integrated solar power. It's woven right into our lives. Makes you wonder what else is just around the corner. Well, one thing that's already making waves is floating solar farms. Floating? Wait, like on water? Now that sounds like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. It does, doesn't it? But it's a real thing, and it's growing fast, Yeah. especially in places where land is scarce. Actually, one of the articles you sent talks about how floating solar could be a game changer in Africa. Countries like Ethiopia and Rwanda, they could use it to meet their energy needs in a clean, renewable way. That's really cool, utilizing what they've already got. But let's be real. Even with amazing innovations like that, solar by itself isn't a magic bullet, right? You got it. It's just one piece of the renewable energy puzzle. And speaking of that puzzle, you mentioned wind power earlier. What's the outlook for other types of renewable energy? Are they seeing the same kind of boom as solar? Well, solar's been stealing the show lately, but other renewable technologies are making some serious progress too, each with its own pluses and minuses, of course. Okay, so it sounds like we need to zoom out a bit. Take a look at the bigger picture of renewable energy beyond just solar. Let's dive into that in our next segment. So we're talking about more than just solar panels, right? What else is cooking in the world of renewables? Anything catch your eye in the listener's research pile? Oh, absolutely. There was a really cool article about this massive solar thermal plant they're building in China. What's wild is the design they're using a whole field of mirrors to concentrate sunlight, and that bumps up the efficiency big time. Yeah, I think I saw that when they're saying something like 24% increase in energy capture, which is kind of mind-blowing. Right. It just goes to show, even with something like solar thermal that's been around a while, there's still room for huge leaps forward. And it's not just solar either. Wind energy's got some exciting stuff happening too. Oh yeah, like those massive wind farms popping up offshore, where they can capture wind energy way more consistently out there than on land. Exactly. The potential for offshore wind is enormous, Yeah. especially for countries with coastlines, obviously. And then you've got geothermal energy, which taps into the Earth's heat. That's a super consistent and reliable source of power unlike solar and wind, which depend on, well, you know, the weather cooperating. Tapping into the Earth's heat, it's like something out of a sci-fi novel. It just makes you think, what else is out there? Any other renewable energy sources we should have on our radar? Well, we can't forget about tidal power. It's still early days, but harnessing the power of the ocean's tides, that's got some exciting potential, especially for, you guessed it, coastal communities. Tidal power. That's been this cool idea floating around, no pun intended, for ages. Cool to see it actually becoming a reality. Okay, so we're basically turning the ocean into a giant power socket? That's wild. It's like Mother Nature's been hiding this massive battery under our surfboards this whole time. Beach bums of the world, rejoice. Your lazy days in the sun are now contributing to clean energy. So it seems like we've got this whole smorgasbord of renewable energy options, each with their own quirks. But the real magic happens when we start combining them, right? Absolutely. Think of it like this. A resilient and sustainable energy system 
isn't about picking one winner and calling it a day. It's about diversifying our energy portfolio, just like you wouldn't put all your eggs in one basket, financially speaking. That way you're covered no matter what. Right. If one source is down, you've got others to pick up the slack. Makes sense. But here's the thing. Solar, wind, tides are all making electricity. What about storing that energy for when we need it? Isn't that like the big elephant in the room? You're hitting on a really critical piece of this whole transition to renewables energy storage. Because, let's face it, the sun doesn't always shine, and the wind has a mind of its own. Right, like we were talking about earlier with the gridlock, that mismatch between when the energy is being generated and when we actually need it. Precisely. And that's why we're seeing more and more investment and in innovation in energy storage technologies. The most obvious one, I guess, is batteries. They're becoming way more advanced and, importantly, way more affordable. Yeah, batteries are having a moment, especially with electric cars and all that. But are they really the only game in town when it comes to storing large amounts of energy, like on a grid scale? Not at all. Another really promising area is pump hydro. It's actually an old technology, been around for like a century, but it's getting a new lease on life with the rise of renewables. Basically, you use excess electricity to pump water uphill to a reservoir. And then when you need that energy, you release the water downhill, spins turbines, generates electricity. Pretty elegant, actually. So it's like a giant gravity-powered battery. I like it. Exactly. And then there's another approach called demand response. Now, this one isn't really about storing energy, but rather shifting when we use it, specifically to times when renewable generation is high. Okay, now you've lost me. Demand response. Break that down for me. So imagine your electricity provider offered you a lower rate if you agreed to, say, run your dishwasher or your laundry during off-peak hours, like in the middle of the day when solar power is abundant. That's demand response in action. Ah, so it's about incentivizing people to use energy when it's greenest, basically. I like it. It seems like we have the tech, policies are catching up, and people are actually on board with this whole renewable energy thing. Uh -huh. But this isn't just some abstract global shift, right? This impacts us all, including whoever's listening to us right now, digesting all this info. 100%. This energy transition has very real implications for everyone. It affects everything from the jobs we have to the way we power our homes. It's a big deal. So let's bring it all home. What does a future powered by renewables actually look like for everyday people? What does it mean for our listener? So we're painting this picture of a future running on this mix of renewable sources, right? With some smart ways to store it all and keep things running smoothly. But like, what difference does all this actually make in people's day-to-day -day lives? That's the part I'm really curious about. Because this whole energy transition, it's not just about megawatts and gigawatts, all those big numbers. It's about people, you know, mm -hmm. the jobs we have, the communities we live in, the kind of world we're building for ourselves, for our kids and grandkids. It's big picture stuff. Totally. And speaking of jobs, that Deloitte analysis you flagged had some interesting stuff about the job market. What kind of changes are we talking about here? Well, they're predicting some major shifts in the workforce, like certain jobs, especially those tied to fossil fuels, those are probably going to decline. That's just the reality. But, and this is crucial, the renewable energy sector, it's going to create a ton of new jobs, lots of opportunity there, but a lot of those jobs will need different skills, different training. So it's not just a transition to cleaner energy. It's a whole reshaping of the job market itself. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a mixed bag, honestly, with both challenges and opportunities. Exactly. We need to make sure that the people in those industries that are declining they have a way to transition their skills, find new opportunities in this growing renewables sector. And that's going to take some serious effort, proactive policies, retraining programs, investments in workforce development. We can't leave people behind in this shift. Absolutely not. It's got to be a just transition for sure. Yeah. But it's not just jobs, is it? I mean, this move to renewables, it has the potential to really shake up global power dynamics too, doesn't it? You said it. For decades, it's been all about oil and gas. Having access to those resources, controlling them, that's been a major geopolitical lever. It's fueled conflicts, driven international relations, the whole shebang. Yeah, oil and gas have caused enough trouble, that's for sure. No kidding. But as we rely less on fossil fuels, as renewable energy becomes more and more central, well, we might see a very different world stage emerge. One where countries are more energy independent, maybe there's less conflict over resources, and developing nations, they have a more level playing field. It's a really interesting idea. It's a hopeful idea, that's for sure. A world where energy isn't something people fight over, but something that brings people together, a force for good, you know. A vision worth working towards, for sure. But we got to remember, the future isn't set in stone, right? 
The choices we make today, they're what shape the energy landscape we'll have tomorrow. And that brings us back to our listener, back to each individual. Because this might seem like this massive, overwhelming thing driven by governments and corporations. But ultimately, it comes down to individual choices. Millions of decisions made every single day. I love that you bring it back to the individual. It's easy to feel powerless in the face of these big global shifts, but we all have a part to play. So for our listener out there, what are some concrete things they can do to be a part of this renewable energy future? What can they do in their own lives? Well, first and foremost, cut back on how much energy you're using. Seriously. <laughs> It's easy to get caught up in the excitement of shiny new technologies, but the simplest and often most effective solution is just using less energy in the first place. You're talking about that sufficiency idea we touched on earlier. Exactly. Being more mindful, making deliberate choices to lighten our energy footprint. Could be something as simple as making your home more energy efficient, you know, better insulation, upgrading to more efficient appliances, or maybe it's choosing to walk, bike, or take public transport instead of driving whenever you can. Little things add up. Those are all great practical steps. And when we do need to use energy, making sure it's coming from renewable sources is key, right? A hundred percent. Whether that's putting solar panels on your roof, pushing your electricity provider for more renewable options, even just supporting businesses that are prioritizing sustainability and how they operate, Every little bit makes a difference. It's about putting your money where your mouth is, right? Uh -huh. Supporting the changes we want to see. Exactly. And you know what else? Don't underestimate the power of just talking about it, talking mm. to your friends, family, colleagues. The more we have these conversations, the more we raise awareness, share knowledge, challenge each other to think differently about our energy choices, the faster we can make this whole transition happen. So it's about individual action, but also community engagement, pushing for change on a larger scale. It's going to be a multi-pronged approach. You got it. And look, it's not about getting it perfect overnight. It's about progress, about those small steps that add up to something big over time. I love that. Well, you've given us so much to think about today. As we wrap up this deep dive into the world of renewable energy, any final thoughts you want to leave our listener with? You know, we've covered a lot of ground here. We've gone from the nitty gritty of solar panel tech to the big picture geopolitical stuff. But if there's one thing I hope our listener takes away from all this, it's that the future of energy, it's not some foregone conclusion. It's a story that we are all writing together right now through the choices we make, the actions we take. So stay curious, stay engaged, and let's build that brighter, more sustainable future powered by clean energy. Beautifully said. Couldn't agree more. A huge thank you to you, our expert extraordinaire, for shedding light on this complex and constantly evolving world of renewable energy. And to you, dear listener, we hope this deep dive has sparked your curiosity, given you some food for thought, and maybe even inspired you to take action. Until next time, keep asking those insightful questions and keep diving deep into the topics that matter to you. Well, my sun-soaking, wave-riding energy pioneers, we've surfed through a tsunami of renewable innovations today. From printable solar panels to oceanic power plants, the future of energy is looking cleaner than a windswept sky. Remember, every time you catch a wave or unfold your newspaper, you might just be looking at the next big thing in clean energy. So keep your eyes peeled, your minds open, and maybe invest in a waterproof solar printer. You never know when you might need one. Until next time, stay curious and keep riding that green energy wave. <laughs> <laughs>